right. Well, I think we'll get started. Thanks, everybody, for being here. Uh, for those of you joining us uh, for the first time, welcome. We're glad you are participating here with EREF Science Sessions. And um, today, we're going to be talking about the uh, topic of rock solid, evaluating solidification of PFAS in reverse osmosis concentrate. We're joined by Paul Rule, the Environmental Remediation Specialist at LaFarge Holcomb, Ryan Shipper, Senior Engineer at Gold Associates, and Pat Stanford, General Manager at Rochem Americas. My name is Brian Staley. I'm the moderator today and president of the Environmental Research and Education Foundation. Um, just a quick uh, few housekeeping items. For those of you who aren't familiar with EREF, we are a nonprofit research foundation funding research grants to universities, uh, conducting our own research internally through data and policy efforts, providing scholarships to students, and then doing educational activities of which the science sessions uh, are part of that effort. Um, in addition to that, these science sessions are structured in a slightly different format than what you may be used to. About 45 to 60 minutes of content, we'll talk about the findings of science, uh, new innovative things that are happening. And then uh, this is more of an interaction uh, with, with presenters, so not a traditional sort of presentation format. I want to thank our sponsors for uh, supporting this effort as a as a charity, we uh, can only exist and do these kinds of things through the support of our sponsors and uh, folks like yourself who are, are joining us. So thank you all so much. Uh, Civil Environmental Consultants, Global Associates, Labella, and Republic Services, uh, thank you all very much for supporting these efforts and our science sessions today. A few housekeeping items. All participants are being muted. We'll ask you to submit present questions throughout through the presentation software. So go ahead and do that. Um, I can't promise we'll get to all of the questions, but we'll do our best to do that. And then um, if you need anything, message the organizer. Uh, the slides will be available for download. Check the handout section. And then, of course, if you need to claim any kind of continuing education, we do provide certificates of attendance. So you can do that. Um, a few words about our speakers today. I, I did mention Paul Rule. He's got 43 years of experience as an environmental professional. Uh, 39 years in the cement industry, and he's been involved with cement solidification and stabilization at contaminated sites in the U.S. for more than 38 years. A lot of experience there. Um, you know, the other point that I wanted to note here is that he uh, has six children and five grandchildren, and to date, none of them have, ex have expressed a significant interest in solidification and stabilization. Uh, Paul, I hope today that's going to change everything, so we'll, we'll see how that goes. Um, also joined by Ryan Shipper who is a registered professional engineer at Gold Associates, over 13 years of experience in active and passive water treatment projects, as, long as, other pro as well as other projects involving wastewater treatment for mining, oil and gas, waste management, manufacturing, and site remediation programs throughout the U.S. and Canada. And then last but not least, we have uh, Mr. Pat Stanford, who is general manager of Rochem Americas. Prior to accepting that manager position, he was VP of Engineering with technical responsibility for all of Rochem's wastewater systems in North America. Over 35 years of experience with reverse osmosis and installed his first Rochem system in 1985. The burning question I have for you, Pat, is what music were you listening to then? Was it Van Halen? Was it uh, Grateful Dead or Twisted Sister? I don't know, but maybe we can get into that. Um, we have time. All right, so if we have time, that, that's right. So um, one, of the la one of the things I wanted to start off with is this concept of, of uh, solidification. You know, this is an interesting topic. Um, it certainly uh, speaks to a technology that's been used, as, as I mentioned with, with Paul's uh, bio. It's a technology that's been implemented across the uh, different industries, the coal ash industry in particular. I know EREF has funded a number of projects on advancing solidification and stabilization technologies uh, on that front. And so this is a new application. And certainly, you know, with, with PFAS, as was mentioned during the last science session, being a topic that, or being a, a compound that is, is challenging to treat, um, and we have uh, very few ways that we can fully destruct this, uh, this material. Um, this technology holds a lot of interest. And so to set the stage, why don't we start off with you, Ryan. Um, talk to us a little bit about why PFAS is challenging to treat and kind of bring us up to speed on that, and that'll help set the stage for some of the other questions we'll get into. Yeah, uh, thank, thank you, Brian, and, and thank you for the introduction and uh, for having me on the panel. I think, I think that really is a, a great question. Um, I'll start off by saying that PFAS treatment in general can be somewhat complicated, uh, no matter what uh, type of water you're, you're, you're looking at. 
Um, and that, that's mainly, you know, we're, we're talking about a group of thousands of different compounds with some pretty highly variable properties. These properties uh, oftentimes uh, make PFAS difficult to break down and most conventional treatment technologies are either not effective or they can actually break down PFAS precursors into smaller, more terminal PFAS compounds. <clears throat> Um, and then also, you know, we're looking at a quickly changing regulatory situation um, where many times uh, we need to treat PFAS down to some very low levels. Um, these factors, you know, really add complexity to, to any type of PFAS treatment for any water. Um, but looking, digging in a little bit further and looking at uh, maybe the leachate specifically there's there's some additional considerations there um maybe maybe to start off most most pfas treatment to date has been done on drinking water um or groundwater sources which are relatively clean the technologies generally used for these clean waters are sensitive to other constituents other than pfas that is and uh in the water and really the Leachate is, is typically a much more complex water matrix and has many parameters that can interfere uh, with some of these technologies that are typically used on, on quote unquote cleaner waters. Uh, these interference parameters can also be orders of magnitude higher um, than the groundwater concentrations. Uh, and many times they may require removal prior to PFAS treatment. Um, the, it, to add to that a little bit more, the competing parameters and the water quality matrix can be highly variable between uh, different uh, landfills based off what type of waste they're accepting, as well as what the state of the waste decomposition is. So in some ways, the leachate quality can be a, a moving target, even even at, uh, at one site. So, uh, you know, is, as a quick summary, I guess PFAS treatment in general can be complicated and leachate can add some additional considerations. I would say that luckily for us, uh, leachate is generally a low volume waste stream and, and is associated with relatively low uh, PFAS loads. So so the story isn't, I guess, all bad, I, I'd say, Brian. Okay, well, that, that opens up the door to the different treatment technologies that exist. So tell us a little bit about these treatment technologies. I know we covered some of that during the last line session for those of you who attended that, but maybe give us a sense for, you know, comparatively, what, what treatment strategies are there and are they destructive or not? Um, and uh, how, how well do they perform, generally speaking? Yeah, thank, thanks, Brian. I think the, the primary treatment strategies for PFAS in, in those, you know, the more clean drinking water or groundwater situations, uh, and again, this is where a majority of the PFAS treatment is being done. So w what they're using in those situations is the granular activated carbon um, and specially ion um, exchange resins. These sorption technologies are sensitive to those competing ions as, as i mentioned and they are less effective for leachate um, and many times those competing ions may need to uh, be pre-treated so you have this the sorption strategies membrane filtration is also used for pfas removal um, and it, it can be more effective uh, for some of the more complex leachate matrices uh, and then I would add that uh, there are many more experimental technologies out there. Uh, you know, I'm not going to go through and list all of them, but there's there's a number of them, um, and 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 many of them have been getting some good results. However, you know, there's there more work is generally needed uh, before uh, some of these uh, attain more of a widespread implementation. Okay. So for, for these technologies that you described, um, are there any that are better suited or perhaps less suited to be used on a land, in a landfill setting to treat leachate, or, or can all of them potentially work on site? 
Yeah, I mean, I, th I think I, I would I would say that uh, the the RO technologies are are definitely better suited, um, in, in that uh, they have less of a of an impact from those from those competing ions. Um, but 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 certainly, you know, if you can if you can manage that, and and every site is going to be a little different as well. So you know, you, you need to look at all the site specific factors, but but. I would say that uh, RO is, is can be a uh, a more applicable technology in in some cases. All right. So so whether it's RO or whether it's some of these other technologies that are used at a landfill, the majority of these, um, or perhaps all of them, at least in the landfill setting right now, that are that are on the shelf, are not destructive. Uh, from what I, I just heard you say. So what um, what happens to the PFAS that that runs through these types of technologies? Yeah, that's a that's a great that's a great question. Um, I think it is it, it is important to note that uh, the 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 sorption um, and filtration methods, as, as well as evaporation. So ev evaporation can also be effective at reducing the volumes requiring management. Um, but you know, more information I think is needed uh, regarding the potential for PFAS release to the gas phase during during that process. Um, but but any of these processes, uh, they do not destroy PFAS, but rather they concentrate it um, or transfer it from one media to another. So so for sorption, you know, that that's generating a, a spent media residuals. Uh, membrane filtration um, obviously generates a concentrated brine stream residual and uh, e evaporation depending on on how far the extent of the e evaporation and crystallization um, can either create a solid or a liquid residual stream and and you know all of these uh, residuals require further management and and or possibly uh, placed back into a properly designed repository or AKA landfill. Okay, and so you, you mentioned membrane treatment. Um, you know, I, I think RO is is one of those uh, I guess would fit in that category, right? In that respect. Yes. Um, so uh, membrane filtration, uh, RO and nano filtration are both effective uh, for, for PFAS removal. Um, both can provide very good removal of PFAS and precursors. Uh, reverse osmosis, it, it, due to its, due to its uh, smaller pore size, um, generally achieves better removal of those PFAS compounds. Um, and and you know there's some data I'm sure Pat will 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 touch on um, some of that coming up, but uh, it, some very good r removals and rejections of the PFAS, and and it's often removing them uh, down to less than the laboratory detection limits. Okay, thanks, Ryan. Well, let's get to Pat then, Pat. Uh, about reverse osmosis, it has been touted as one of the better strategies for PFAS treatment currently, you know, that's on the shelf. So tell us about that. Why, why is that? Um, how does the technology work? And then, you know, how much concentrate or, or residual can we expect from this particular type of technology? Sure. Uh, so reverse osmosis is a membrane-based separation technology that was originally developed back in the 70s to as a, a way to desalinate seawater. How do you make drinking water or seawater? We've got to take out sodium chloride molecules that are in the water. So it was designed to take very small molecules out of water. Uh, it works as a separator, as I said, you put one stream in and you get two streams out. So instead of clogging up like the oil filter in your car that eventually plugs and has to be replaced, there's a cross flow stream uh, that goes across the surface of the membrane, carries the residual material out of the module, lets the clean water pass through the membrane, and that lets us go through and have a very long membrane life. Typically, ROCHEM systems are having someplace between a, we'll guarantee a three-year membrane life. We often see five to seven-year membrane life on the, on the systems. And ROCHEM does do things a little differently. We've got a special membrane module that has been designed from the ground up for treating landfill leachate, rather than repurposing something that was really designed for cleaning clean water and trying to apply it to a very little dirty leachate stream. When we're trying to remove small molecules to very low levels, as we're talking about with uh, PFAS compounds, we're going to do a multi-stage process. 
Uh, in the image that's up right now, the first leachate will go into the leachate stage where we'll do a preliminary concentration. We'll take that concentrated material and run it through an ultra high pressure concentrate stage that runs up to about 1750 PSI. Uh, and then we'll take both of those clean water streams and run them through a third membrane to get even cleaner effluent that's able to go out. And typically we'll make about 90% recovery. So we'll take the original volume and 90% of it will be clean water that is basically suitable for sewer discharge or in many cases, uh, direct discharge through an NPDES permit and then 10% residual leachate. Uh, and traditionally, uh, most of the landfills have that are using our systems for the last 30 years have just recirculated that material directly back to the landfill. Okay, and so, so based on what you described, basically for every 100 gallons of leachate going into the system, 90 gallons is going to come out, you know, clean, uh, basically, uh, if we're treated, yes. uh, it's probably the better way to say it. And then uh, 10 gallons is going to end up going to landfill. Is that fair? That's a very good way to spit it. Okay. So, so normally then it's going back to landfill. Is, are there any special strategies then in terms of placement of that concentrate in the landfill? Or is it basically placed on the working face like with, with the waste stream and, and it just kind of gets mixed into the, to the waste that way? It can pretty much be just put back on the working face. You want to avoid trying to over concentrate at one place. You don't want to put enough in, in a certain location that you can end up with channeling where it's not going to go back. Uh, at the EREF conference, Global Waste Solid Waste Management in uh, 2020, uh, I presented a paper that showed that putting the residuals back to the landfill does not appear to have any long-term impact on the leachate concentrations, uh, either for PFAS or just general inorganic compounds that we've been able to to go through in 10 to 20 years worth of operation seen very little change in the concentration of the leachate due to the recirculation of this material back but that's always a concern and there are certainly uh, landfill companies that for other reasons want to keep liquids out of the landfills there are other operational reasons to want to keep those compounds out of there sure sure so well how so how good does reverse osmosis do at removing the PFAS then based on some of the work that you guys have done already? Uh, it does uh, a, a very good job on it. Um, yeah, here's, the, here's some of the data on it. And this is a system that has been running for about 10 years. Uh, when we installed the system, neither I nor the customer could spell PFAS. Um, this was done with no modifications to the system. We, when it started to become an issue, we just went out, collected samples uh, and we're able to do this. We actually did the full scan of 37 PFAS compounds. These were the ones that were above 100 parts per million in the leachate. There were about another eight or 10 that were between detection limits and 100 parts per million. And then there were about 15 or 20 that had uh, effectively were not detected in this specific leachate. Through the first pass, um, leachate going through. We took thousands of parts per trillion down to single digit parts per trillion on all the compounds. And after the second pass effluent, none of it was detectable above the detection limit that was available at that time when we did these samples. So it works very well. Um, anything, any organic compound in our experience, more than about uh, 100 molecular weight is effectively 99% removed by reverse osmosis. The smallest of the PFAS compounds that I've been able to come up with right now are about 400 molecular weight. So it's going to do a very good job of taking all these compounds out. Now, I'm interested, Pat, is this, um, I'm curious to know if you, you thought this was an expected result because with reverse osmosis, in many respects, the design of the technology it, it is really, it, it catches a lot of, of, of molecules, the contaminant molecules already. So in that respect, when, when this PFAS issue first came up, what, what were your thoughts? Were you, were you thinking, yeah, th this is going to do a pretty good job, or were you kind of in the, I'm not sure, camp? Or what, what were your we, thoughts? We, I, I was very certain that the reverse osmosis was going to do a great job of taking all these compounds out. Uh, we actually, uh, 10 years ago, uh, we ended up with a project where we first learned about parts per trillion in Michigan on trying to remove mercury to a discharge limit of 1.3 nanograms per liter. So at that time, I was a little concerned about does the science change as you get to very low concentrations? And it doesn't appear that that's the case with either the mercury or with the PFAS compounds. 
and one of the great things about RO is that it's a very broad spectrum technology. It doesn't care what the mixture is. It's going to be able to take everything out. So the humic acids, all the other organics, the feed stream that this data has shown was coming in with about uh, 3,000 parts per million BOD, about 8,000 parts per million COD. Those were also being reduced, and the second pass effluent from this site uh, is being discharged through a NIPTES discharge permit. Okay, so that, that's helpful. So, well, let, let's get on then to the solidification stabilization process. Paul, I want to I want to bring you into the discussion as far as that's concerned. Give us a quick, you know, in layman's terms, what what is solidification stabilization? You know, I, when I first heard of this, I I pictured this almost monolithic Stonehenge-like, you know, material that 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 you were creating through the solidification process. It just sounds so permanent and so you know, uh, almost. Uh, uh, like rock-like, if, if you will, but and that's really not quite the right picture. So, uh, based on what I've, I've seen more recently, so do you want to walk us through one? Uh, what, what is this process? Um, how how do you um, solidify something or, or stabilize something in that respect? And then, um, how does that apply to this uh, PFAS situation? Well, solidification, stabilization are terms of art in the environmental world. Stabilization is a chemical change. And with products, cementitious pozzolanic materials, uh, they're very basic in solution. And so they will react with heavy metals and turn them into metal hydroxides, which will then uh, become particles and no longer TCLP toxic. Solidification is just what it sounds like. You're making something hard. And in my experience, I have had dirt, sludge, slime, crud, slop, liquids, and you take these cementitious products, these pozzolanic products, and you simply make them harder. The uh, binders will start to bind in three dimensions. And as it does that, it will physically encapsulate those things which are not being destroyed. And the, the heavy metals that have been converted to, to metal hydroxides are encapsulated. Any organics that are present are encapsulated. And within the confines of this particular uh, webinar, the PFAS are simply large organic molecules that are fairly easily encapsulated as the binder starts to bind in three dimension. And it gets it harder. In fact, you're going to see a little bit later on, uh, substantially harder because we're taking a, uh, yeah, I see this uh, slide here, you have the RO concentrate that came through the RO system. And the RO that we were working with the concentrate we were working with uh, had still had substantial amounts of PFAS in them, some in the tens of thousands of parts per trillion nanograms per liter. And um, I was approached by a longtime friend and a colleague of mine, uh, Paul Scrisha, who also works at uh, at Rochem, and he knows what I do, and he asked me if I thought I could solidify this concentrate, and my answer was immediately, sure. I've solidified liquid waste for years, but can I do it in an economical way? And then the after almost three years of R&D, uh, part of this presentation today is to suggest that, yeah, it can be done uh, effectively, and it can be done um, very economically. And I do have to make one uh, little statement is that uh, uh, Lafarge Holson does have a patent pending on the process I'm about to describe. And that I just thought I should probably put that in there. Now, what we did is uh, since there was no um, textbook on how one goes about encapsulating PFOS in RO concentrate, uh, the, the first page of that textbook was written at lunch when I was having lunch with Paul Screech and we started scribbling down notes as to what a successful test might look like. And that led to an initial attempt at about 42 different blends of, of cementitious pozzolanic materials, whittled that down to about 21, and then finally settled on about five. And from that, we selected what you see in the middle picture, a pre-made, pre-blended uh, proprietary uh, binder that was then loaded into that ready-mix truck that you see. And it was the, then a proportional amount of RO concentrate was also blended or loaded into that ready mix truck. And ready mix trucks are really, really good at homogenizing 
whatever is inside of it. So what was going on inside the ready mix truck was a really good blend of binder and the RO concentrate. And if you go to the next slide, you can see where um, the ready mix truck discharged the, the slurry into the spray truck that you see on the right. And that slurry that you see being sprayed on, all of that liquid is RO concentrate. And then on the left-hand side, you can see it being applied as an alternate daily cover. And I think this was the real, I think this was the final step that made it back, back up one, just one more, please back up to the previous one. I think this uh, applied daily cover was the final step in making this a really successful uh, program because uh, as one landfill operator said to me, he loved putting the concentrate back into his landfill as a solid instead of a liquid. Because as Pat mentioned earlier, very frequently the, the technology is the RO concentrate is simply recirculated back into the landfill. And, and at some point in time, you capture it again and you run it through the RO system again and it ends up back in the landfill again. And what this does is it permanently breaks that cycle. It takes that RO concentrate, turns it into an alternate daily cover. And what's really, what, what, what I really like about this particular final mix that we came up with is it's a slurry, as you can see, but once it's on the ground, within about 30 minutes, it starts to firm up. And by the next day, when they're ready to put waste back on the uh, face of the landfill, I call it peanut brittle. Uh, this this uh, picture here is a, a an attempt to uh, add a little levity. Up until three years ago, I, like I say, I could say everything I knew about PFAS in about a minute. And in the last three years, because of my association with Rochem, PFAS has become my, uh, about three quarters of what I do. And around Lafarge Wholesome, somebody thought it was really funny to start calling it Paul Foss. So as you can see on the far right picture there, this is, uh, I was wearing uh, gloves when I put my handprints down and wrote Paul Foss in the alternate daily cover as a, uh, uh, just as a kind of an inside joke and it made it into our, uh, our slide presentation. But you can see this is about 15 minutes after the stuff had been sprayed in place. You can see it's already starting to firm up. So there is, there is some timing involved between mixing the uh, concentrate along with the, the binder and then spraying it in place. And once you put it, mix it together, you probably ought to think about spraying it in place and pl placing it as an alternate daily cover. And um, in this fashion, we have, I, I, this is 100% resource recovery, recycling, reuse. Instead of letting that uh, RO concentrate go back in, to the landfill and be captured again someday or go off site and pay a disposal fee either through a uh, wastewater treatment plant or some other uh, facility, you are now using this RO concentrate uh, for something that you gotta have anyways, which is an alternate daily cover. Uh, you can go to the next one, please. Yeah, so what, one thing I wanna talk about then, Paul, is, is if, we're, if we're talking about this stuff, you mentioned the recipe and I wanna go back to that real quick because I, I felt like we covered that uh, we went over that rather quickly, and I want to make sure for the audience they they know what what goes into this. So you've got the RO concentrate. You mentioned pozzolanic material. Can you elaborate on what what kinds of things are considered pozzolanic materials? And then um, and then you've got this cement binder, or all they are they all considered one and the same? So yeah, can you the elaborate same, on there's, there's, there, there, yeah, there's synonyms. A pozzolan is a cementitious material that when it's hydrated, it gets hard. In the simplest okay. of terms. And so what I, I, what I did is I said, like I said, initially, I, I made up 42 different mix designs using different pozzolans or different cementitious type products. Cement is not a monolithic one thing. Cement companies like us will make a dozen different products throughout the, the country. And okay. uh, finding the right one at the right price was the, was the challenge. And so, um, as I say, I started with 42 mixed designs, quickly cut that in half and have come down to, for this specific, specific, excuse me, landfill, a, a mixed design that works best. Uh, I anticipate somebody asking me the question, so I'll answer it ahead of time. You cannot assume that the mix that works at this particular landfill will work at the next one exactly the same. 
There's no such thing as a homogeneously contaminated site. There's no such thing as a homogeneous RO concentrate. There is a lot of similarities. It's still mostly water, but depending upon what's in the landfill and other can local conditions, the, uh, the final mix will probably be different from site to site to site. Similar, but not the same. So it's not a one size fits all. And anybody who does environmental remediations knows that. You may do 10 sites that, are, that look very similar, but because of local conditions, uh, sometimes you've got to tweak your, your solution. But a, a binder of some sort can be used on any of these RO concentrates. It just requires a bench test to come up with the optimum one instead of just, like I say, one size fits all. You want to optimize the binding system that you use for this encapsulation process. So, so in the bench test, one would basically take the RO concentrate whatever posolons they may have available to them and basically start doing different mixing ratios, find the one that's optimal for their specific situation or, or site location. Is that, is that fair? Yes, that is, that's fair. That's actually essentially what we do with the bench test is we identify the best binder for that particular source. Okay. So, so you got that, uh, you got the optimum you know, mixing ratio for your particular site. For example, this stuff is encapsulated. Um, now, how do we confirm uh, that it's encapsulated? How do we how do we confirm whether it's going to leak out? I, I know you've done some work on different testing as it relates to this. So you want to let's get into that a little bit and describe some yeah, of please. the testing. That you've done. Mm -hmm. And the uh, the method that I like the best, and I think the one that is the absolute most relevant, is EPA method 1310B. It's called the structural integrity test. And you make these little monoliths. If you'll see in the left picture, there's a number six and there's a mold of a prescribed size, 7.1 centimeters tall, 3.3 centimeters across. You make your mix, that's that, that little um, vial that you see there, or that mold, that used to be liquid concentrate. It has been blended with the uh, cement binders that I had uh, prescribed for this particular site and it is put into this mold and it's by, uh, by the method, it cures for 30 days. At the end of 30 days, you cut it out of the mold and you put it in that compactor, which is what you see on the right. Well, you see it on the left as well as the right. It's disassembled on the left, but in the right, you have a 0.33 kilogram mass dropping six inches on top of your, uh, your little miniature monolith. And you do that 15 times. And let's go to the next one and you can see what happens uh, with, the, uh, with these. The one on the left was compacted 15 times and you can see it, it maintained its integrity quite well. The one on the right uh, had a different binder in it and it did not withstand the compaction test anywhere near as well. But why this is important is when you are finally done, you take either the whole monolith like you see on the left or the pieces that you see on the right and you do an SPLP extraction on them. This is all, again, per the EPA method 1310B. And the reason I like this the best is because, um, it, uh, would you please go back to that previous slide just, just for a moment? Because what you have here is a dramatic reduction in surface area. When you have a, a RO concentrate, you basically have infinite mixing of the pollutants inside of a liquid. But when you solidify it, you've reduced that infinite mixing to 90, almost 91 cubic centimeters on that whole uh, cylinder that you see on the left. Obviously, the system on the right will have a higher surface area. And the only, where, only place, I should say, that the extraction fluids from the SPLP extraction method can extract a PFAS out of that system is on the surface. So if you have a whole monolith, like the one on the left, you have grossly reduced the potential for the extraction fluids to extract a PFAS or any other pollutant for that matter. Uh, go ahead to the next. Now what we, I've just, everybody gets excited about these three uh, PFAS uh, congeners. Obviously there's a whole lot more of them, but the samples that we received had these levels that you see here and you'll see one that says sand and one that says no sand. 
Uh, the reason I put sand in one of them is because I thought it would be helpful to give the binder something to bind to other than itself, and it allows you to use less of the binder than if you use no sand. With a no sand mix, the, uh, the cementitious blend uh, serves two purposes. It is, absorbs moisture and acts as a small aggregate, and then, of course, it's a binder as well. But you can see in both cases, there's a dramatic reduction in the amount of available PFAS as you uh, as you solidify this stuff. On the first ones, uh, you've got the obviously 100% removal of the PFNA. The second one, 99.9% .9 of the PFAS is removed, and the PFOA, 99.8. And then on the second one, you have uh, obviously 100% removal of PFNA, PFAS, and the PFOA is 99.6%. Uh, in all cases, except for that last PFOA one, they all meet uh, Michigan drinking water standards. Now, you don't have to meet drinking water standards within a landfill because it's secure. But we have been able to get even the PFOA in other, um, other mixes, as you can see in the one ahead on, on top with the sand, we can even meet the drinking water standard for PFOA, which is eight parts per trillion. I'm using Michigan's uh, drinking water standards is that if for that comparison because the landfill we've worked with is in the state of Michigan but protected uh, through a non-disclosure agreement which I of course will honor but I have to meet the Michigan uh, standards for PFAS in general but again we don't have to meet drinking water standards but I just wanted to show what we can do the dramatic reduction in available PFAS we're not destroying it we're encapsulating it we're taking it permanently out of the environment. It's going into a landfill where it's going to be safe and secure. It's going into an alternate daily cover, which is a needful thing anyhow, and it will be physically uh, contained. And the reason I like the SPLP going back to that is, it's of course the synthetic precipitation leachate procedure. And it is reasonable to assume that the solidified alternate daily cover sitting in a landfill over time is going to be exposed to acidified rainwater. So I believe that this, this is the most realistic uh, testing methodology for this, uh, for this process that we developed. And, and similar to the RO uh, technology, uh, when, you, when you're doing the solidification part, it's not just the, the PFAS that is encapsulated. There, there are other materials as well, right, that, that get uh, basically sequestered as part of this technology. Is that right? Oh, absolutely correct. Uh, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, any, any metal ions, uh, heavy metal ions are in the S, you can look at that. Uh, you can see that the, uh, the metals are converted to metal hydroxides and become very, very uh, reduced in the, in the leachate, in the SPLP extraction, I should say. And I picked some of these because a lot of landfills uh, are not yet regulated for PFAS. So some states are more aggressive than others. But some of the landfills that are talking to us from other states are concerned about conductivity, for instance. And so chlorides or some of these ions, sodium and things like that um, are of concern. And I wanted to demonstrate how we can dra dramatically reduce the availability of, uh, of the anions and the cations and some of these other things like COD and, and uh, total dissolved solids. All of those can be dramatically reduced by cement encapsulation. And so I have uh, some selected data here. These are typical. All I can assure you they're not cherry picked. They're just typical data that we see when doing the, uh, the cementitious, cementitious encapsulation of the RO concentrate. Um, and, and some landfills are simply expressing an interest in the alternate daily cover aspect of it because they're able to take this, this concentrate out of the system and reduce the amount of liquids going back into their landfill. Okay, well, thanks for that. Let me, let me turn this back to Pat for a minute. Um, you know, Pat, when you look at these results, do you uh, feel like that this solidification strategy uh, is effective you know, as it's coupled with RO and not only for PFAS, but what are your thoughts about other potential contaminants? I mean, is, is there a, um, 
is there an attractiveness as you look at this, um, you know, representing the RO side of things uh, for solidification for other things besides PFAS? Yeah, absolutely. That the binding up anything, right? Landfills, the whole idea is to keep as much liquid out of the landfill as possible. So if we can return the concentrate off the RO back as a solid rather than a liquid, that's certainly going to be better. Although we've got 20 plus years worth of experience returning liquid concentrate and not seeing any real impacts. Uh, there's been concern in the last several years about uh, temperature effects of uh, liquids being returned to the landfill, about slope stability issues of liquids returned for impacts on gas wells due to liquids being returned. So there are lots of reasons besides the leachate itself that somebody might not want to return the liquid to it. And this gives a combined system uh, and based on the numbers we've seen so far, the cost of the ROCHEM system, uh, capital and operating costs combined with the Lafarge Wholesome capital and operating costs is actually a very cost competitive solution uh, in terms of approximating the cost that we're seeing a lot of people having for offsite disposal. Um, and as offsite disposal costs, trucking costs and disposal costs go up, uh, to have this on site and have control of your own destiny of what you're doing rather than being dependent on somebody else's willingness to accept your material uh, can be a very large benefit also. Yeah. So when we when we think about this particular strategy and, and, and also perhaps where, where things are going, I, I know uh, something that you've been following that for a while, uh, are the current available strategies are they the end all be all? I mean, is this pretty much where we're at with PFAS management? Do you think that's where we'll stay in the future? Um, no. you know, what, what, what's your um, kind of projection on where, what the future holds in terms of management of PFAS from landfill leaching? It's going to change a lot. As Ryan said earlier, as Stephanie uh, Bolliard said in the last science session a couple of weeks ago, pretty much all of the technologies for PFAS destruction are still really in the experimental stage there, right? PFAS is becoming an issue is only a five-year-old problem. And to develop a technology from uh, a academic university to a technology that's available on a large scale commercial basis to handle waste coming from 3000 landfills uh, is a 10, 15, 20 year process to develop it, to find the best one to scale it up. So those destruction technologies are not gonna be available for a while. Um, the EPA interim guidance talks about how do we isolate PFAS from the environment and from human contact until those destruction technologies can be caught up. Anything we can do to keep those things going back to the landfill is a good thing. And landfills are doing already doing a great thing on landfill. Ari Kremen in, from Tetra Tech uh, did an article in the November 2nd issue of uh, Waste Advantage magazine and talked about doing a high level study that landfills are already sequestering a lot of PFAS compounds that are coming in with the waste, uh, with some of the other things, but that the leachate is the largest outflow of PFAS coming back out. Now coupling a reverse osmosis technology to reduce the volume to the point that solidification becomes an economically viable alternative. Now all of a sudden you can cut that other one, which then for makes the landfills whether we like it or not, landfills are going to be the interim solution for PFAS. The only two places that you can isolate PFAS from the environment are deep wells and landfills. There are no other options today to do that. So the landfills are going to become the largest source of PFAS at some point. They're going to certainly become the largest sink for PFAS. And as an industry, you should really be in front of it and say, we're the solution, not we're part of the problem or no, we're not part of the problem step up and say, we are the solution. Let's put the pieces in place so that we can put the PFAS into the landfill and keep it there. So it's not being transferred to another site, to another facility and increasing the circulation and the cycle. Let's cut the PFAS cycle and keep it where it's supposed to be in the highly engineered landfill that's designed to contain all these things. Yeah, I, and I know a, a couple of science sessions back when we were talking about the policy side of things. I mean, that was certainly my takeaway is that unless there's an, all, an outright ban of PFAS materials in terms of production and use, um, you, you know, there needs to be a repository for this material right now. I know that's something the EPA is very focused on is looking at different technologies. But e even with that said, I mean, this, this material is widely dispersed throughout the environment, throughout consumer goods and, and so forth. So concentrating it uh, seems to be one of the first strategies uh, to deal with that. And then as that happens, 
uh, then then we can look towards other treatment technologies. And so certainly, I, I agree. There's, there's no way this is going away uh, soon. So Ryan, you mentioned earlier that various technologies and treatment strategies that are being used, and I want to kind of sort of end this with you, and then we'll turn to some of the audience questions in terms of where where are things at in your perspective? What additional science, what additional technology and research do you think is needed to uh, advance this space? Yeah, yeah, thanks, Brian. And you know, I, I think just just touching on uh, you know while we're not there yet on on some of these uh, development stuff, there there has been a lot of good positive results. Um, Golder's doing a, a lot of research um, with with technologies that can destroy a PFAS. They're typically, you know, to make it feasible, you want to concentrate it up as much as possible. Um, but, you know, we, we've got some good recent results showing uh, PFOA and PFOS removal to less than the U.S. EPA advisory in, in, in less than 30 minutes. Um, so I think that there there is, there's still more work to be done um, from those standpoints, but, uh, you know, it, eventually, uh, some of those destruction technologies uh, could come on online and help from that aspect as well. Okay, great, thank you. Um, let's turn to some of the audience questions. So, um, can or will the residuals be considered hazardous waste? Um, I'm not sure if any of you have any particular thoughts on that. Um, Pat, you're looking like you yeah, might have something to say. Let me take, uh, take the first crack at that one, and then Paul might have a comment on it also. Um, we have evaluated the concentrate coming off the RO uh, system uh, as whether or not it's hazardous waste. Under current regulations, we have never had a condition where we have concentrated things up to the point where they have become hazardous waste. Uh, as regulations change and what the definition of hazardous is, uh, there has been hopefully erroneous discussion of regulating PFAS as hazardous waste, which would be a bad thing. Uh, in which case, yes, then any uh, leachate could potentially end up being declared as hazardous in that case. So we can't say what's going to happen with future regulations, but it goes from there. Um, and Paul's technology for solidification has been used for years to go through and uh, bind up uh, heavy metals so that they will pass the TCLP test so that they're not considered hazardous. And along, along that line, are there any regulatory hurdles for the solidification strategy? Just any that you're aware of, or is there any particular special processes to go through to be able to use it? Ryan, do you have any thoughts on that? You're nodding your head, so I... Uh, yeah, um, I, I guess I, I'll, probably, I'll probably let Paul or, or Pat handle that one. Um, see what they have to say there. Uh, this, this, is, this is Paul. Um, presently, in Michigan, the only... The only regulatory hurdle that we have to uh, get get over is applying for an alternate daily cover permit mod on the solidified uh, RO concentrate because the concentrate presently at the landfill we're working with is presently going into the landfill. So all we're doing is solidifying it and putting it back into the landfill as a solid material as an alternate daily cover. So uh, as I say presently, that's the only regulatory hurdle, if that's the right term. It's a, re it's a regulatory requirement, which I am confident we can meet and be in compliance. And I also echo Pat's comments about, I think it would be a serious problem if uh, the concentrate was considered a hazardous waste. The uh, state of Michigan has one hazardous waste landfill. And there's not a whole lot of hazardous waste facilities that could take the volumes of material that would be needed. I concur with Pat. I think the best place for this, I mean, this, the source is the landfill. If we can contain it and keep it in the landfill, we've done a very positive thing for the environment and grossly reduced any kind of risk to human health and environment by doing it that way. Okay. So the source is not the landfill. The source is the incoming waste. I, I the landfill just it. happens to be the, the person. Yes. The source of yeah. the concentrate is the landfill, but the landfill itself is is just an intermediate holding step as this goes through. It still needs to be taken care of, just like you don't want litter blowing off the landfill and going anyplace else. You really don't want the PFAS coming out of the landfill and going anyplace else. So it needs to be handled, but the, we need to make sure that we're clear on it, that the landfill is not generating PFAS. It's all coming in with the incoming trash. 
I, and I, I, I agree with you. I guess what I'm saying is what we are solidifying is RO concentrate that did in fact come out of the landfill, but the ultimate source of the PFAS was not the landfill. I agree. Correct. Okay. And Pat, I think this is also a question for you um, related to RO. Is there, uh, can you can you speak to the relative cost of doing an RO solidification versus an RO crystallization ZLD type of strategy? Um, it's hard to make a general judgment because it all depends on the sizes of, of the systems and what you're looking at. Uh, at some point, uh, the you're going to have different differential costs on there. The larger the system is, the more likely that a thermal system for at least some further concentration is going to make sense. Uh, as the smaller the system is, the more likely it is the, the smaller volume to be solidified is going to make more sense in there. Uh, they can both be economically feasible, and we just have to look at each specific site and what's available. Someone who has gas is more likely to has landfill gas, right? Not everybody has gas. Uh, it has landfill gas is going to be able to do a thermal process much more economically than someone who doesn't. So there's going to be a cost curve there too to determine whether or not you should be doing a solidification process first, or if you should do a thermal process first and then take the residuals off that and run it through a, a pozzolanic process to go through and solidify it and encapsulate the PFAS because there's none of these technologies make anything go away. Everything is a concentration process. Everything has a residual, whether it's granule activated carbon, whether it's sludge coming off the evaporator, whether it's ash coming out of an incinerator, nothing makes it go away. If you're starting off with a thousand pounds a day worth of total solids in your leachate, at the end of the day, you still have at least a thousand pounds worth of material. Something has to be done with that in any technology that you're going to use. Okay. Just to follow on to that a little bit i mean you, you know the the one exception there pat might or you know might be the the incineration if you're able to get those temperatures up high enough and obviously incineration is a high cost and and you can also have issues with 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 generating um hydrofluoric acid uh during that destruction process but uh but 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 certainly yeah that there there could be ways to 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 destruct that pfas uh, from a thermal standpoint um but but there there are challenges as well associated with that okay so another question about the the application of the solidified material as an alternative daily cover is it if, if that's applied and it creates, in essence, a uh, kind of a shell-like material, is that going to potentially impede, in, in your opinion, uh, movement of liquid through the waste mass? Is that going to be problematic, or um, will it still allow liquid flow through the landfill? Let me uh, let me uh, let, uh, let uh, me take uh, hop that on that one first, Paul, and then you can go you can go on go from there. So one of the one of the uh, requirements that we first mentioned to Lafarge when we when Rochem first started talking to them about that was that we needed to make sure that the material was not going to cause an impervious surface and cause any purchasing perching of leachate or anything else. So we have been talking since day one about this, about trying to make a uh, the term I've been using is a friable material, something that's going to break up re relatively easily. And the whole one of the design criteria that Paul has been using is to go through and that something as the compactor runs over it the next day is going to crum crumble into something like gravel or sand that will then drop down into the interstices of the waste, take up very little space, and make sure that we don't create a material that's going to be impervious and impede the flow of the leachate in any way. The only thing I the only thing I would add to that is uh, the, the the alternate daily cover that we have now made. Uh, as I was describing it earlier on, 24 hours after it's down, I call it peanut brittle. You can literally break it just by standing on it if you just stomp on it; it'll fracture. So as they start putting waste on it the next day, and the compact the, the equipment runs over it, uh, this stuff breaks up um, very nicely. But it's it's not impervious. Okay, and that, that's a, there's another question that came across that I think kind of relates to this. Knowing that in certain uh, in, in situations as waste is placed in the landfill, you can get acidic conditions with uh, acetic acid and lower pH. Um, how vulnerable is this process to, uh, or uh, 
with the solidified material be to being uh, broken down, for example, due to low pH or exposure to acetic acids and other volatile fatty acids in the landfill? I'm glad you asked that question. That's what the SPLP extraction method exactly does. The SPLP, the synthetic precipitation leachate procedure, is supposed to simulate 100 years of exposure to acidified rain. And I do believe the SPLP extraction method uses acetic acid. And so the leachate data that you see there uh, in the previous slides were from the extraction process of an SPLP um, uh, extraction process. And that was what leached out after tumbling for 24 hours and being exposed to this acidified um, media. So the answer is, I expect to see exactly what we saw on the data that was presented. Very, very low leachability, even when it is exposed to a, a acidic medium like acidified rainwater. And even if it does tend to leach something, you still have, it's going to go in with the rest of the leachate because it's in the line subtitled E cell, go back to the RO system and go around. And now we, what we've done is short circuited. So now the PFAS cycle, instead of including the wastewater treatment plant and the lake and all the way throughout everything, we've short circuited and now made a PFAS cycle that only is as big as your site. So this is a safety net. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, and on the testing side, uh, this question came across as well. If the material is being sprayed in a thin layer, um, maybe describe the benefits of the testing procedure in terms of structural integrity that looks like it's uh, testing more of a monolithic structure. Is, is there a, a, an additional testing that might be needed to confirm uh, how the material is being sprayed onto a landfill versus more of a monolithic style test? Well, here's the, 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 the easiest question or answer I can give you is I believe that EPA method 1310B is closest to what we are doing. We are, we're not making those little cylinders, with that, but that's what the test calls for. And the assumption that I make, at least from reading the regulation, is if you go through the 1310B procedure, cure it for 30 days, and do your compaction testing, and then the SPLP extraction, the material that you have made, you have reason to believe that you're going to have the leaching that you find in your leachate from the SPLP extraction. There is, there is no um, EPA method that you can do on a thin uh, layer of crust, my peanut riddle. There is no, there's no test that I can do other than follow the 1310B. But the assumption is after 30 days that that uh, cementitious binder is binding up your pollutants of concern. And in this particular case, it's PFAS. It's the best I can give you because there is no test that allows you to test on wafers. Okay. Um, two more questions and then I, I think we'll have you guys uh, keep a, a key summary, a key takeaways. So. Uh, one another question came across in terms of just volume of this solidified material versus the volume needed for alternative daily cover. I suspect that there's enough concentrate that could be solidified that's generated to supplement a full daily cover application, but not enough to to be the full alternative daily cover application. Do I, do I have my head uh, twisted on right for that, or is there sufficient volume to to allow for it to be an alternative daily cover in more of that macro sense? Um, I, think that the answer is, I, I believe the answer is yes. Go ahead, Pat. Yeah, uh, there should be, you're correct, there, the, there might not be enough of this uh, RO concentrate uh, solidified material to act as the full alternative daily cover. There might still be sections that are going to need to be covered from there. Uh, and if it turns out the other way for some reason that you've got a very small portion of the working face open, you could just spray this on more uh, in a thicker layer and take care of it that way. Uh, that we haven't really done a large study on the volume that's being produced versus how much open area there's. So many landfills have so many, operate so differently in terms of how large of a cell, how much open face they keep going. Uh, that's actually a very hard question to answer on a, a general basis. And certainly there's, there's you know, a, a big variable, you know, amount of leachate that can be generated between sites as well. So. 
Okay, yeah, that's my thought too. So last question, a lot of questions came in about cost of this. Uh, does anybody want to weigh in relative to what the cost would be for a RO slash solidification type strategy relative to some of the other you know, technologies or costs that are out there? Uh, let me let me do the best I can on on that one. It's going to be very site specific, just as all your leachate co disposal costs are very site specific right now. The one that we have done the best analysis on till right now uh, is a relatively small landfill, uh, approximately 20,000 gallons a day average flow. We're looking at putting in to handle peak flows about a 40,000 gallon a day RO system, even though we're only looking at the 12,000 12 million gallons a year worth of total leachate flow. Uh, and on that system, their current uh, going cost is about 12 and a half cents a gallon to haul and dispose of the leachate uh, to the POTW. Uh, we believe that based on our preliminary numbers that the cost of operating capital cost and operation cost combined amortized over the total flow is going to be less than that 12 and a half cents a gallon to keep everything on site and not have to haul anything off site. Uh, typical cost that we quote for, for the RO portion of this is gonna be someplace in the three to four cents per gallon range. So the solidification does add a significant step to it, but in many cases, it's still gonna be less than the future disposal cost. Somebody might have a better rate than that now, but we all know that disposal rates just keep going up. Okay, then we got to wrap this up. I want to uh, give you guys a quick uh, you know, minute or so left. Uh, parting thoughts, key takeaways. Uh, Ryan, why don't we start with you? Yeah, yeah. I guess I key takeaways. I think there's a lot of good work being done um, on on this this side to try to better manage uh, and, and and come up with PFAS solutions. Uh, I think. You know that there's there's probably a, a big benefit to additional research um, in terms of <clears throat> kind of understanding maybe uh, PFAS emissions, possibly if you're going to go to an evaporator or incineration, um, and, and for the re further research done on on destructive technologies. So I, I think there it, obviously you know there's there's some good options out there that that need some further um, you know, uh, some further work, but uh, this, I think, using an RO system followed by by the solidification is, is one of the, one of the more developed at, at this time. Okay, and Paul, any last thoughts? Yeah, I'd like to reiter reiterate something that Pat said earlier. Uh, this 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 process will permanently remove PFAS from the environment. There are only, as he says, two repositories that will be able to isolate PFAS from the environment, this and deep well. I like the fact that the landfills will be able to take the stuff out of the environment, hold on to it, and we don't have to see it again. And as I said earlier also, one of the things I really take great pleasure out of this is the resource recovery recycling aspect of this particular thing. We're taking a a, a byproduct of the uh, the RO concentrate and turning it into an alternate daily cover, something that they need to do. And I think that's really a, uh, I think that's a really significant part of this whole process. Okay, great. And Pat, uh, how about you uh, take us home? Any last thoughts? All right, a uh, couple of things. PFAS is modern life. We've got it in everything. It's out there. Landfills are and leachate are trailing indicators. Even if they banned all production and use of PFAS today, the landfills would still be doing, dealing with it for the next 20, 30, 50 years. So landfills are gonna have to come up with a solution to be able to deal with PFAS. As Paul said, it's the only reasonable repository. You put it down a deep well and you find out it's more dangerous than you thought, it's gonna be almost impossible to get it back. You put it in the landfill, at least it's near surface and it's acceptable. Bigger picture, society is telling us they want PFAS handled. There can be arguments about whether or not the science says that it's dangerous or not, but if you don't wanna argue with, right, you don't wanna get between a mama bear and a cub. If, you, if the moms of this country and the dads of this country think that PFAS is in their drinking water and it's gonna endanger their children, whether it's today or when they're 70 years old, you don't wanna be in between them. So, we have the ability as an industry to go through and be the solution. And really we have the obligation to be the solution. 
to get PFAS out of the environment. How we're going to do that, whether it's our technology, Paul's technology in combination, whether somebody's going to come up with the perfect thing, Golder's technology, takes a long time to scale up to destruct technologies. We need an isolation. We need encapsulation. We need a way to isolate this for right now. What we're talking about today is commercially available pretty much off the shelf. And as far as I know, we're really the only one that is commercially available off the shelf that's suitable to go into leachate today. Yeah, and, and an innovative twist on uh, technology coming in from the more really the energy side with the solidification coupling that with existing technologies. It's, uh, it's, it's great to see that uh, these things are being pulled together. Great to see a, a team like you all working together to make this happen. Gentlemen, thank you so much for your time today. Uh, for for those of you who are, yeah, thank you very much. And then for those of you who are attending, just as a reminder, you always see reporting as well as an evaluation early next week. We'd encourage you to take that. And uh, when you do that, you'll also get a certificate of attendance for, for doing so. Thanks again, uh, speakers. Uh, guys, thanks so much. And attendees, thank you all for joining us today and hope you all have a great rest of the day. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Brian.